Saint Clair. Uh, we're about to start chapter 17 of Grandfather Frog. Um, let's see. So a story about my dad. Um, well, it isn't a story exactly, but it's it's our little ritual that we used to have on Saturday nights. Uh, dad would um, would have me get out all of his shoes to be shined, and I'd lay out newspapers all over the kitchen ta the kitchen floor, and I would sit on the floor and I would polish all of his shoes for him, and then we would sit and um, Dad would read me. Um, Stories. He would either read me James Thurber. Uh, you, you're a little too young for James Thurber, but I think you'll enjoy him when you get older. And he would read me Shakespeare, and he would read me poetry. And then we would play either gin rummy or cribbage. Someday I hope to teach you how to play cribbage. It's a great game. It's a great game of strategy, and two to three people can play. And uh, I wasn't really able to start beating Dad at cribbage until he became a very, very old man. But uh, I remember those Saturday nights fondly. Um, we stopped doing them so much when I was a teenager because I was kind of an idiot as a teenager, as some teenagers are. And I didn't want to hang out with my father. Well, you know, I wish I could have those, those Saturdays back because I would certainly hang out with Dad now. I'd give anything to be able to hang out with Dad again. But he's gone now. Uh, so that was my dad, Saturday night. He set, he set aside this block of time for me, and I'll always be grateful for that. Okay, so chapter 17, Striped, Striped Chipmunk, that's very hard to say together, Striped Chipmunk cuts the string, because as you recall the last time, Grandfather Frog was hiding under a board, but his legs were still tied together, so he couldn't escape. And he was waiting for Farmer Brown's boy to come back from his dinner. All right. Hippy hop, flippy flop, all on a summer day, my mother turned me from the house and set me out to play. Striped chipmunk knew... Boy, that is hard to say together. Striped chipmunk, striped. Striped chipmunk. Striped chipmunk knew perfectly well that 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 was just nonsense. Okay, let's start this again. Okay, so there's a little poem here. Hippy hop, flippy flop, all on a summer day, my mother turned me from the house and sent me out to play. Striped chipmunk knew perfectly well that that was just nonsense, but striped chipmunk learned a long time ago that when you are just bubbling right over with good feeling, there is fun in saying and doing foolish things. And that is just how he was feeling. So he ran along the old rail fence on one side of the long lane, saying foolish things and cutting up foolish capers just because he felt so good. And all the time seeing all that those bright little eyes of his could take in. Now, Strike Chipmunk, and the merry little breezes of old Mother West Wind are great friends, very great friends indeed. Almost every morning they have a grand frolic together, but this morning the merry little breezes hadn't come over to the old stone wall where Striped Chipmunk makes his home. Anyway, they hadn't come at the usual time. Striped Chipmunk had waited a little while, and then, because he was feeling so good, he had decided to take a run down the long lane to see if anything new had happened there. That is how it happened, that when one of the Merry Little Breezes did go to look for him and was terribly anxious to ask him to come to the help of Grandfather Frog, he was nowhere to be found. But Striped Chipmunk didn't know anything about that. He scampered along the top rails of the old fence, jumped up on top of a post, and sat up to wash his hands and face. For Striped Chipmunk is very neat and cannot bear to be the least little bit dirty. He looked up and winked at old Mr. Buzzard, sailing round and round way, way up in the blue, blue sky. He chased his own tail round and round until he nearly fell off the post. He made a wry face in the direction of Redtail the Hawk, whom he could see sitting in the top of a tall tree way over on the green meadows. He scolded Bowser the Hound who happened to come trotting up the long lane, 
and didn't stop scolding until Bowser was out of sight. Then he kicked up his heels and whisked along the old fence again. Halfway across a shaky old rail, he suddenly stopped. His bright eyes had seen something that filled him with curiosity, quite as much curiosity as Peter Rabbit would have had. It was a piece of string. Yes, sir, it was a piece of string. Now, Striped Chipmunk often has found pieces of string, so there was nothing particularly interesting in the string itself. What did interest him and made, and made him very curious was the fact that this piece of string kept moving. Every few seconds it gave a little jerk. Who ever heard of a piece of string moving all by itself? Certainly Striped Chipmunk never had. He couldn't understand it. For a few minutes he watched it from the top rail of the old fence. Then he scurried down to the ground and, a few steps at a time, stopped to watch sharply between each run. He drew nearer and nearer to that queer acting string. It gave him a funny feeling inside to see a string acting like that, so he was very careful not to get too near. He looked at it from one side, then ran around and looked at it from the other side. At last he got where he could see that one end of the string was under an old board, and then he began to understand. Of course, there was somebody hiding under that old board and jerking the string. Striped Chipmunk sat down and scratched his head thoughtfully. Whoever was pulling that string couldn't be very big, or they would never have been able to crawl under that old board. Therefore, he needn't be afraid. A gleam of mischief twinkled in Striped Chipmunk's eyes. He seized the other end of the string and began to pull, such a jerking and yanking as began right away, but he held on and pulled harder. Then out from under the board appeared the queer webbed feet of Grandfather Frog tied together. Striped Chipmunk was so surprised that he let go of the string and nearly fell over backward. And there's actually a picture of Striped Chipmunk. Uh, he seized the other end of the string and began to pull, and there's old Grandfather Frog coming out from underneath the board. Whoops, microphone fell off. Okay. <gasps> Why, Grandfather Frog? What under the sun are you doing here? he shouted. When Striped Chipmunk let go of the string, Grandfather Frog promptly drew his feet back under the old board, but when he heard Striped Chipmunk's voice, he slowly and painfully crawled out. He told how he had been caught and tied by Farmer Brown's boy and finally dropped near the old board. He told how terribly frightened he was and how sore his legs were. Striped Chipmunk didn't wait for him to finish. In a flash, he was at work with his sharp teeth and had cut the cruel string before Grandfather Frog had finished his story. Chapter 28, Grandfather Frog Hurries Away. When Striped Chipmunk cut the string that bound the long legs of Grandfather Frog together, Grandfather Frog was so relieved that he hardly knew what to do. Of course, he thanked Striped Chipmunk over and over again. Striped Chipmunk said that it was nothing, just nothing at all, and that he was very glad indeed to help Grandfather Frog. We folks who live out in the great world have to help each other, said Striped Chipmunk, because we never know when we may need help ourselves. Now you take my advice, Grandfather Frog, and go back to the Smiling Pool as fast as you can. The great world is no place for an old fellow like you, because you don't know how to take care of yourself. Now, when he said that, Striped Chipmunk made a great mistake. Old people... <clears throat> never like to be told that they are old or that they do not know all there is to know. Grandfather Frog straightened up and tried to look very dignified. Chugarum, said he, I'd have you know, striped chipmunk, that people were coming to me to, for advice before you were born. It was just an accident that Farmer Brown's boy caught me, and I'd like to see him do it again. Yes, sir, I'd like to see him do it again. Dear me. Dear me, Grandfather Frog was boasting. If he had been safe at home in the Smiling Pool, there might have been some excuse for boasting. But way over here in the Long Lane, not even knowing the way back to the Smiling Pool, it was foolish, very foolish indeed. No one knew that better than Striped Chipmunk. 
but he has a great deal of respect for Grandfather Frog, and he knew, too, that Grandfather Frog was feeling very much out of sorts and very much mortified, mortified to think that he had been caught in such a scrape. So he put a hand over his mouth to hide a smile as he said, Of course he isn't going to catch you again. I know how wise and smart you are, but you look to me very tired. And there are so many dangers out here in the great world that it seems to me that the very best thing you can do is to go back to the Smiling Pond. But Grandfather Frog is stubborn, you know. He had started out to see the great world, and he didn't want the people of the Green Meadows and the Green Forest to think that he was afraid. The truth is, Grandfather Frog was more afraid of being laughed at than he was of the dangers around him, which shows just how foolish wise people can be sometimes. So he shook his head. Chugarum, said he. I am going to see the great world first, and then I am going back to the Smiling Pool. Do you happen to know where there is any water? I am very thirsty. Now, over on the other side of the long lane was a spring where Farmer Brown's boy filled his jug with cold, clear cold water to take with him to the cornfield when he had to work there. Striped Chipmunk knew all about that spring, for he had been there for a drink many times. So he told Grandfather Frog just where the spring was and how to get to it. He even offered to show the way, but Grandfather Frog said that he would rather go alone. Watch out, Grandfather Frog, and don't fall in, because you might not be able to get out again, warned Striped Chipmunk. Grandfather Frog looked up sharply to see if Striped Chipmunk was making fun of him. The very idea of anyone thinking that he, who had lived in the water all his life, couldn't go get out when he pleased. But Striped Chipmunk really looked really in earnest. So Grandfather Frog swallowed the quick retort on the tip of his tongue, thanked Striped Chipmunk, and hurried away to look for the spring, for he was very, very thirsty. Besides, he was very, very hot, and he hurried still faster as he thought of the cool bath he would take when he found that spring. <sighs> Chapter 19. Grandfather Frog jumps into more trouble. Oh my goodness. He just can't seem to stay out of trouble. Some people are heedless and run into trouble. Some people are stupid and walk into trouble. Grandfather Frog was both heedless and stupid and jumped into trouble. When Striped Chipmunk told him where the spring was, it seemed to him that he couldn't wait to reach it. You see, Grandfather Frog had spent all his life in the Smiling Pool, where he could get a drink whenever he wanted it, just by reaching over the edge of his big green lily pad. Whenever he was too warm, all he had to do was to say, chug rum and dive headfirst into the cool water so he wasn't used to going a long time without water. Jump, jump, jump. Grandfather Frog was going as fast as ever he could in the direction Striped Chipmunk had pointed out. Every three or four jumps, he would stop for just a wee, wee bit of rest, then off he would go again, jump, jump, jump. And each jump was a long one. Peter Rabbit certainly would have been envious if he could have seen those long jumps of Grandfather Frog. At last, the ground began to grow damp. The farther he went, the damper it grew. Presently, it became fairly wet, and there was a great deal of cool, soft, wet moss. How good it did feel to Grandfather Frog's poor, tired feet. Must be I'm most there, said Grandfather Frog to himself as he scrambled up on a big mossy hummock so as to look around. Right away, he saw a little path from the direction of the long lane. It led straight past the very hummock on which Grandfather Frog was sitting, and he noticed where the ground was very soft and wet. Okay. And he noticed that where the ground was very soft and wet, old boards had been laid down. That puzzled Grandfather Frog a great deal. It's a sure enough path, said he. But what under the blue, blue sky does anyone want to spoil it? for by putting those boards there. You see, Grandfather Frog likes the soft, wet mud, and he couldn't understand how anyone, even Farmer Brown's boy, could prefer a hard, dry path. Of course, he had never worn, worn shoes himself, so he couldn't understand why anyone would want dry feet when they could just as well have wet ones. He was still puzzling over it when he heard a sound that made him nearly lose his balance and tumble off the hummock. 
It was a whistle, the whistle of Farmer Brown's boy. Grandfather Frog knew it right away because he often heard it over by the smiling pool. The whistle came from over in the long lane. Farmer Brown's boy had had his dinner and was on his way back to look for Grandfather Frog where he had been dropped. Grandfather Frog actually grinned as he thought how surprised Farmer Brown's boy was going to be when he could find no trace of him. Suddenly the smile seemed to freeze on Grandfather Frog's face. That whistle was coming nearer. Farmer Brown's boy had left the long lane and was coming along the little path. The truth is he was coming for a drink at the spring. But Grandfather Frog didn't think of this. He was sure that in some way Farmer Brown's boy had found out which way he had gone and was coming for him. He crouched down as flat as he could on the big hummock and <gasps> held his breath. Farmer Brown's boy went straight past. Just a few steps beyond, he stopped and knelt down. Pe peeping through the grass, Grandfather Frog saw him dip up beautiful clear water in an old cup and drink. Then Grandfather Frog knew just where the spring was. A few minutes later, Farmer Brown's boy passed again, still whistling, on his way to the long lane. Grandfather Frog waited only long enough to be sure that he had really gone. Then, with bigger jumps than ever, he started for the spring. A dozen long jumps, and he could see the water. Two more jumps, and then a long jump, and he landed in the spring with a splash. chug a -rum! cried Grandfather Frog. How good the water feels. And all the time, Grandfather Frog had jumped straight into more trouble. I think we'll end there. Uh, the next chapter, chapter 20, is called Grandfather Frog Loses Heart. Oh, goodness, he's depressed. Depressed about his situation. So we'll find out more about that the next time. Good night, boys. It was nice reading to you.